So, hello and welcome to the third and final session of this conference, A New Era for Green Infrastructure, which has been organised by the TCPA on behalf of the Green Infrastructure Partnership. I'm Julia Thrift and I'm the Director of Healthier Placemaking at the TCPA, the Town and Country Planning Association, and I'm chairing this final session of the conference. Before we go any further, I'd really like to thank Green Blue Urban, the Landscape Institute and Heatherwick Studio for sponsoring the conference. And it's because of their generous sponsorship that we're able to provide this conference to you all free of charge. And we have people from the UK and all over the world joining us. So thank you very much to our sponsors. Next slide, please. And now for the final session of the conference, creating and managing urban green spaces to maximize multiple benefits. We'll be hearing about some very different projects in different nations, but all of them share a commitment to maximizing the multiple benefits that good green infrastructure can create, from improving public health to reducing the effects of climate change, including providing benefits such as urban cooling and water management, whilst also contributing to creating fantastic, attractive and successful places. We'll hear from the speakers first and then have time to take questions at the end. So please post your questions in the Q&A box, which should be, I hope, at the bottom of your screens. And feel free to tweet about the conference, um, ideally using the hashtag NewEraGI. Our first presentation is about managing parks and green spaces with a strong focus on health and well-being. We have two presenters, Catherine Max and Barry Emerson, and I'm going to introduce them both now and then hand over to them. So Catherine has over 30 years governance, management and consultancy experience with high profile public and voluntary sector organisations, including the NHS and local government. She provides strategic and specialist advice in social and environmental sustainability, public health, health and social care, placemaking, urban design and related areas. And she's a trustee of Sastrans, the national charity making it easier for people to walk and cycle and has had various other non-executive roles in a range of sectors. And our other speaker for this session, this presentation is Barry Emerson. Barry is currently the head of parks for Islington Council in London, responsible for management, maintenance and development of the borough's 122 parks and open spaces. He's worked in local government for 20 years in a range of roles, but found his true passion when he moved into the park sector. Wonderful to hear that. He has over 12 years experience within the parks industry, running a wide range of different aspects and has played a key role in developing the joint Camden and Islington Parks for Health strategy, which we're going to hear about. So welcome, Catherine and Barry, and I will now hand over to you. Thank you, Julia. So if I can just move to the next slide, and I'll go speak for a couple of minutes. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, the only thing I'm going to add about myself is that I live on the Camden and Islington border, and I had the best lockdown job ever, getting to work on parks which are, are local to me, let alone working with Barry and the team. Um, what I'm going to do is provide a high level overview of the strategy, um, which was approved earlier this year by the two councils, um, including a little bit of background um, about how it came about as a result of a major grant programme and pause on some learning from the process of developing the strategy. And then I'm going to hand over to Barry, who will go into more detail about implementation with a particular focus on workforce development and what Parks for Health means for Islington's Park Service in particular. So next slide, please. Um, oh, I didn't manage to get to the next slide. There you go. So excuse me flicking between the two because I've got notes on the second screen. So as I mentioned, Parks for Health originated with a major grant programme, which was the Future Parks Accelerator. Um, and we heard a bit about that earlier um, in passing really from uh, colleagues from Birmingham. And that programme is all about the sustainability of parks broadly defined. The particular impetus for the Camden and Islington bid was that the councils have a shared public health team and it was a joint bid by then and the two discrete park services 
which looked to honour the spirit of the 19th century public health legislation which brought parks into being, but reimagined them as 21st century health assets. As a bid and as a programme, Parks for Health benefited from very strong political support across both councils and a genuine commitment to partnership working both between the two councils, between the different teams and with stakeholders across the community. The other thing to say about the bid was that it set parameters and success measures from the start, but it was also very um, pragmatic and opportunistic and responsive um, when it came to implementation. So next slide, please. Like all good strategies, we began with the vision. There was a bit of a vision, as I said just before, about public health assets, um, 21st century, but this more um, granular, comprehensive uh, vision was developed as part of the process of working on the strategy and working on the grant programme with stakeholders. And it was an important lesson, in fact, from all of that, that process matters and that developing a sense of ownership and working on things together was really key to its success. I am going to read out the vision because it's quite easy to skate over it and there's a lot in there um, which people might want to explore later. So Camden and Islington's public parks and green spaces are used, enjoyed and maintained as health assets for the whole community. Everyone feels welcome in our parks. More people than ever before visit and stay for longer, enjoying nature and taking part in activities which make them healthy and happy. Our parks are places where people can come together or spend time alone be active or pause and reflect. Our parks are at the heart of community life. So this is really a progressive, contemporary and arguably urban interpretation of public health. It has health and well-being as more than the absence of illness. It's about thriving. It speaks to the fact that health is improved by addressing the wider socioeconomic determinants of health. Um, I think everyone um, who's present today knows about the evidence for green space and health. And it has diversity and inclusion and reducing inequalities very much at its heart. Next slide, please. So that vision um, in to oh, we've missed one. Have we got one? We've got the public, that's the one, thank you. Parks for Health Priorities. So that vision and the strategy are underpinned by a set of health and demographic priorities, which are based on the joint health and wellbeing strategy priorities, which every local authority in England has. Um, and importantly, also based on an assessment of where parks and green space can have the most impact. An iteration and development of those priorities and reflecting on those over time um, was very much part of the partnership between parks and public health. And we heard similar about this from Simon Needle earlier as well when he was talking about Birmingham and working with their public health team. So shout out to Justin Barney. Um, vision and the priorities and the strategy um, in turn are supported by um, a set of high level goals and themes of which one, um, I've managed to move my slides on now, um, of which one is about developing the workforce to strengthen our capacity to improve the health of residents and reduce inequalities. And that's what um, Barry is going to be speaking more to. But there are other themes as well, very much about investing in our parks, but crucially about working with others, whether it's community organisations or the NHS or wider partnerships. And that's very much present um, in the strategy and plans for the future. So next slide, please. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavour of what we did during the grant programme period as the strategy and new ways of working were tested and developed. Um, as I've said, the uh, idea was always to work with others within the councils and the wider community. And uh, this is very much uh, how everything was developed over the two to three years of the grant programme. And there was a concerted upfront effort to engage widely and respond opportunistically as well. So for example, uh, the, the teams were successful in having some DEFRA green social prescribing pilot funding quite early on, which was joint between um, NHS colleagues, the voluntary sector and the councils themselves. So among other things, uh, the programme developed and tested different models for valuing green space in order to build the business case. That was also something else that Barry led on so he could expand if people are interested. The informal working that had been evolving with the NHS and others was evolved into a much more structured green social prescribing offer, which has put the team in good place for working with the new NHS structures, which came into being earlier this year. The whole range of projects and capacity building and shared learning opportunities, bringing council teams together with community groups, 
modeling, for example, a model known as the Healthy Parks Creators, which brought people together um, on sort of even basis and had products uh, that came that uh, were developed as a result, for example, guides, peer guides for voluntary sector organizations wanting to use parks in different ways. And also people came together in order to um, put in other bids for, for joint funding. And that joint funding work is something that's come through as an important aspect of the newly uh, restructured team in Islington. So next slide, please. Um, some of what we learned. Um, there's a formal evaluation done of the programme uh, conducted by Public Health. Uh, learning was also uh, developed and shared um, informally through bringing people together, as mentioned before, and you'll be able to find some of the outputs of that on the Future Parks Accelerator website, um, on Shared Assets website, who led the work with the voluntary sector, and indeed on my website, because I did a few blogs. So just to give you just a few examples of things that came out which were interesting. One is, it, one is about what is it about parks and are they different? Um, they do mean things to different people in different sectors. And although it's a pragmatic decision to focus on parks, as you might imagine they are, um, as part of the, the grant funded programme, it was generous, but it was finite. That distinction isn't entirely meaningful to people. And this, I guess, will be music to the ears of people working in green infrastructure, that if you talk to people generally about greenness in where it is that they live, if there is likely to talk about a green space on their estate or you know, a cemetery came up. People talked about city farms um, as well as parks. Um, so that's very powerful in a, a dense urban environment. And the strategy looks to taking the principles of Parks for Health out into the, the wider public realm. Parks are both free and open access. Risks and opportunities around that. It's not entirely controllable. Um, and as a park service, you've got to decide how you feel about that. The activities there are very visible. So there's a responsibility and again, an opportunity to model different kinds of activities led by and for different people in order to make them as feel as more inclusive as they intend to be. And that question of permission is one which can easily be, can be explored as something very interesting because on the one hand, free and open access means that anyone can tip up, but people can also be unsure about what they do need to ask permission for. I'm nervous talking about the pandemic as an opportunity, but we do know that it did increase awareness of the value of green space. At the same time, um, inequalities became even more um, visible and social and cultural barriers, for example, around perceived safety or just feeling embarrassed to do something, do stop people using parks. I do very, very basic things, um, loos and benches, loos and benches, they come up every time you talk about parks and green space. And the other thing to note is one of location. Even in a big city where you would think people were used to just moving around and traveling quite big distances, the fact is a lot of people do not travel very far at all in order to um, access their green space. So you need as much green space, as high quality and as open as possible near to people if you want them to enjoy it. And next and last slide from me, um, a little bit more about what we learned. And this is very much to segue into to Barry's part of the presentation, because it's about ways of working. Um, developing the strategy, working on the grant programme, enabled the councils to develop new networks and partnerships, um, which were, are going to be more sustainable for future working. Um, and there's a range of different ways that you can work together. Co-production can be fetishized. Um, it's not always realistic to do genuine co-production. It's not always the right thing um, or just possible. Um, but people do value longer term relationships and building on those and just doing stuff together is a great equalizer. Um, I think the last thing that I will mention, because I don't want to take up much more time, is that interestingly, both council staff and the voluntary sector were a little wary of asking too much of each other. It wasn't that they wanted to, it wasn't that they actually, you would think it would be a question they did ask too much of each other. If anything, both groups um, held back a bit um, and the process of working, gen, um, working together genuinely enabled people to understand what strengths they could bring um, as well as the limits so that it could be a genuine partnership. So just to quote Anita Gracie, who until recently um, was a stalwart of Oct Octopus Community Network, Let's play to our strengths. The councils have the parks and we have we bring the people. I'll hand over to Barry. Thanks, Catherine. Um, 
So as Catherine said, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, we implemented uh, Parks for Health and turned it into business, to, business as usual. We've got this lovely strategy that Catherine helped us produce. Well, how do we make it a reality and how do we sustain it? And, and that's, that's the challenge we're now facing as we move more into, into delivering this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, we, we had the strategy, but underpin, underpinning that strategy, we had a delivery plan, which sets out sort of our actions over the next 12 to 18 months against all our different themes and how we are going to take Parks for Health forward. Um, under that, we, we've developed a series of performance indicators so we can actually measure the impact we're having. I think, uh, as anyone in local government will know, at the moment, you need to be showing impact, you need to be showing your worth. Um, if, if anything, if nothing else, it's just to maintain your funding stream. So that's a key part of what we developed as part of the program. Uh, the plan is to review that, um, that action plan and that pro program with all our partners on a yearly basis. And that, that brings two benefits. One, to bring different insights, to share learning, what's gone well, what's not gone well, what are the objectives for our partners and how we can utilize that joint working with our spaces to take things forward. But also just to, to reaffirm those partnership networks that we've created through this, pro this project. Those partnerships have been invaluable and have been a key part for making the success. That will then lead to an updated plan, which will then form into a new cycle. Next slide, please. So a key part of this is, again, how do we set our workforce up to be able to sustain and deliver Parks for Health? Well, first things first, same funding challenges apply to us. There's no extra funding around. Uh, if anything, we're all being squeezed tighter and tighter and with this current state of the economy. That's not going to get any easier. But I think through the Parks for Health program, what we've shown is the, the, the real value that the parks play in the early in intervention and prevention agenda that is across so many of our different services, whether that's children's services, social services, uh, you name it. Um, and as a result, when we put our restructure through, apart from a previously agreed um, medium term financial savings, we weren't asked to make any further cuts to our service, which in this day and age is, is quite a result. Um, some of the key roles that we look to um, implement to sustain our Parks for Health uh, program, I mean, we were quite lucky, we had quite a, a, a well resourced park service, but um, we did find that there were some different gaps in that. And what we've created is a, a parks partnership manager. And that's someone who will lead on that action plan and really work on sustaining those partnerships with our VCS partners community, other internal organizations and public health, um, because you have to sustain those partnerships. You can't just assume they're going to carry on um, naturally. You need to be putting in the effort, reaffirming those relationships and shared outcomes and goals and, and working. Um, as Catherine alluded to, we've created a, a fundraising and grant application support officer, not only to be able to ensure we've got capacity to take advantage of the funding opportunities the council can draw on, but also to coordinate and support our community partners in funding applications that they may be able to tap into, um, because they are struggling for resource and capacity. And if we can help and support in different ways, we can, we can draw some money into their environment. Um, we've also looking at our restructuring our grants maintenance service. One of the things that we tested through the, um, through the uh, project was to create a community gardening team, which was funded by our housing team and, and looked at working closely with residents in those estates. And we found that by giving them operational on the ground support, um, we've been able to one, leverage in a whole lot of extra funding to fund those improvements, but two, to really build up a strong community base on those estates. And we now wanna replicate that a little bit more in our parks and actually sustain that going forward. Um, and the structural changes are underpinned by a changing program that looks at, at really continuing to upskill and change our ways of working. And, and one of the key things here, and I'll, I'll touch, if we go to the next slide, I'm jumping to the last point on this, but it's what we learned from this project was that we are not the best people to deliver everything we've set out in the strategy. Um, we need to utilize um, our skills to become more enablers and focus on um, providing opportunities um, and, and the facilities and the capacity needed for our community partners to, to deliver their outcomes in our spaces, which is a fantastic way of actually making sure we're tackling those, those hard to reach groups and those demographics that we're looking to target. And just, uh, just very quickly, I mean, we, we carried out a review of our workforce. We looked at all our different levels, worked out where we could um, delete some posts to create those capacity to, to fund those new posts. 
but also looked at making sure that every single staff member knew what their role is in delivering this. And that actually, even if you are um, just doing litter picking, sweeping on a day-to-day -day basis, that's an incredibly important part in, in delivering healthy spaces that people want to go into. And we wanted to make sure that all our staff knew what their roles were. And we, we spoke to our community partners um, and we looked at the social and partner infrastructure to, to look at what, what was available there and how we could work together. And if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Because in Islington, we've got an incredibly rich um, social infrastructure. We've got strong VCS partners, strong charities. Um, we, we've got a 53 Friends of Parks groups who are very active and want to get involved. And what we did through this process is we brought all those people together and looked at the opportunities of how we could enable them to realize their goals through working with us. And things like working with... Um, Age UK, they, when we got funding through the Mental Health um, Prevention Fund, we commissioned Age UK to be able to support their users into our spaces. And that's, that's incredibly powerful because those, some of their users would never have entered their, uh, our, our activities or our programs without that real engaged support. And they played, and once they got them there the first time, it wasn't a question of, oh, thank you for that. It's when is the next time? How can I come back to it? And we worked with our, our Bright Start team, which looks at 0 to 5, Bright Lives, which is um, the sort of the teenage age groups. And they are in touch with those, those young people, those families that are sort of it really would benefit from engaging with nature. And we've been able to work and join, do partnerships with them to actually start to really bring a whole different um, target group into our spaces. And as I said, we've been working with the NHS Trust already as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, as I said, a lot of what we're trying to do now is about support for internal partners and the community. We've been working with um, some of our internal teams like um, the Bright Start team, our, our community teams, to provide them with support and link ups. So all our Bright Start uh, practitioners now are trained up to deliver forest school programs. So instead of delivering a program in a, a children's centre, they're actually bringing user groups uh, of children into our spaces. Um, we've had now a couple of intergenerational events where we've had Age UK, um, the Bright Start team, uh, Whittington Health, where we've had over 150 people attend a um, targeted activity in the park, which has only been advertised through targeted um, interventions, but not through the general sort of way of getting people involved through notices and social media. And that's making sure we really are, again, hitting that, those target groups. Um, we are training uh, our own staff in volunteer management so that those gardeners who normally would just go out and do their work, they're actually now going out and doing work alongside community partners and actually seeing the benefits for themselves because they're getting more help in, in their spaces, taking the pressure off them, and they're actually getting more fulfillment from actually working alongside community partners. We've also been supporting community groups with basic training like first aid, um, access to some mental health training, um, insurance stuff to be able to give them the confidence to to work with different user groups and to expand what they're doing we've developed those uh, good practice guides with shared assets that Catherine uh, mentioned and helped support as well um, and we've facilitated linkages between the different partner groups so garden classroom who are deliver our forest school programs they've actually worked now with the schools and they've done a whole training session for teachers around actually delivering outdoor education sessions in our parks and green spaces and a basic thing as well is just about thinking about how you um, really enable your spaces to be used by the community. So what do they need to be able to uh, function? Things like toilets, power supplies, water supplies, uh, outdoor learning venues, looking at building those things into any parks, uh, redevelopments, any capital improvements you're doing. So really thinking about those users as an end result. Next slide, please. Um, so what's next? Um, as, as Catherine alluded to, the, the learning that we've got from Parks for Health is, is, is really critical that we push that out into the wider public realm, be that on our housing estates or our, um, our sort of our highways areas, because Islington's got the second least amount of open space anywhere in the country. Um, and yet we've got more green space on our housing estates. So it's about making sure that we're taking the learning from those areas and applying it to our housing estates. And we're working with the housing new build team, we're working with our planners to be able to influence design early on so that those that, that learning is being uh, shared into those spaces. 
We're also working on another Future Park Accelerator program, which is uh, uh, called uh, Nature to the Doorstep. And that's looking at creating a strategic plan to develop green spaces on the highways and looking how we can regularize that activity. And Islington's also got uh, um, a, uh, I get the name of it, apologies, a natural, natural environment investment readiness fund um, bid, which we've been successful in. And that's looking at creating an urban uh, park, pocket park framework. And again, looking at how we can we can create those spaces on our, our, our highways and open spaces. And we just out of as an example, we've got a thousand stub roads in Islington that could, could potentially be turned into pocket parks. You know, take out a few parking bays, put in some trees, put in some um, benches, create some interactive spaces. That has the ability to create huge amounts of uh, green infrastructure. Um, and then the other part of that is looking at how we finance that. And as I said, we're looking at sharing learning through our housing new build team as well. And I think I will end it there. Thank you very much. Uh, Catherine and Barry, thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating and lots of food for thought. And it certainly uh, made me want to ask you lots of questions. I noticed uh, none of the audience have put any questions in the question and answer box, but I'm sure people will have questions. So do post your questions as we go along and we'll come back to them at the end of the presentations. So I'm going to move on swiftly to our next speaker, um, who is Howard Gray, a consultant at Green Blue Urban. And Howard has long been an urban tree advocate, and he intuitively understands the essential necessity of levelling up access to green space and having a healthy urban tree canopy cover. And he's worked with architects, landscape architects, contractors, and local authority officers to achieve the aims of all stakeholders. And his concern is best practice methods for long-term quality to enable healthy urban places for all. And so. Howard, welcome and over to you. Thanks, Julia, and thanks everybody for coming on today. Um, it's my privilege to speak to you today. What we find is that in many of our urban spaces, uh, urban places, that the, the real green spaces that we have, the, the largest area of, of urban open spaces are highway. But when we're planting, talking about greening up the highway, we have some pretty significant problems. And, and amongst them are the below ground constraints that we find in pretty much every situation we, wherever we, we, we try and um, to, to plant into. So I want to talk about a little bit today as to how we can adapt our grey spaces, how we can make our streets, our highways, um, how we can actually make them more climate ready, really, climate change ready. So next slide, please. So one, um, one project I'd like to bring up very quickly is Alfred Place Gardens, which is just off Tottenham Court Road in the centre of London. Um, it was a very busy, quite a busy street to cut through, a part useful to park if you're working in central London, but it was re-envisioned re by the local authority and thinking about what we could do, how we could actually make this very vehicle dominated street, how we could turn it into something that's um, been a far, a far more use to humanity. So next slide, please. <clears throat> And what we see is working with LDA, working with the local authority, we've actually turned this street into a public park. Um, you might say, well, it's not easy now to perhaps to service the properties. There is still access to service the properties. But what we've done is we've rethought the priorities. Rather than giving the maximum space to vehicles, we've started rethinking that and giving that over to pedestrians. Now, this takes a big leap of imagination when we start thinking about how we could reimagine our areas. Next slide, please. So one of the th reasons, one of the levers we've got at our, our disposal is the matter of climate change. And unfortunately, what we're actually seeing is that the um, urban heat island is becoming um, fatal. Um, I think over this last summer, I think about 3,000 people died prematurely across the UK because of too much heat, because of the fact that our, um, our cities, our, our built environment, our 
our concrete, our bricks, our tarmac, they soak up the heat during the day and then they release it very slowly at night. So we don't get a dip down, we don't get a cooling at night time. So what we are seeing is an urgent need to intervene into our cities to make the changes. Now we could just put in air conditioning everywhere um, if we had the money to do so, but more than that, if we have the run money to run it, we're seeing in, the, in, the, in a, an area of increasing price rises, we won't be able to afford that sort of cooling. So we have to start thinking about natural cooling. And this is a great opportunity to think about those multi benefits. Next slide. And we've got the other extreme as well. We need to think about how we can combat um, the more extreme rainfall events. So we're trying to design our cities. Um, we're using natural based nature based solutions that both deal with our heat, uh, open heat island effect, as well as the risk of flooding. And this is something that green infrastructure, when it's thought properly about, can do very, very well, as we've heard already in some of the previous speakers. Next, please. So once we start planting trees properly, what we find is very quickly, they can become, uh, get a, give us a return on our investment. What we're often looking for, and particularly when we're having to justify financially what we do is how quickly do we start getting our money back? And what we find particularly with urban trees is that if, if we plant them in best practice methods, in decent uncompacted soil volumes, with very, very short length of time, we start getting major benefits. Now, this is in Ma uh, St. Peter's Square in Manchester. Eight years after planting, these trees have already reached their 50 year um, um, planned sizes. So they've already grown very much to give us those benefits. And they're absorbing a huge amount of carbon and sequestering that within the soil and within themselves already. Next, please. And the other. Uh, side, same, so, uh, same place, slightly different tree, but these trees are holding a huge amount of water. It is absolutely amazing when we see how much water can be held on our green infrastructure um, above ground. Next, please. So we want to think about how we can adapt and the adaptation is often more difficult because we're working around existing infrastructure. We're trying to work around um, existing buildings, uh, existing vehicle or, um, pathways and below ground constraints. This is Northwood Hills and this is um, a, a project that was started about eight years ago by the local authority in Hillingdon to regenerate this area by significant planting in the central media of the high road. Next, please. What we can see is that has changed the whole character of the area. And this, this program has significantly um, increased footfall for the retail establishment. It slowed traffic down, which has actually led to a, an increase in, in retail sales. Next slide. And this is a bit further down the road. What we've got is now seen as a far nicer place to be. It's a place to stay a bit longer, to spend more money. And this, the main change in this was, was putting a central median in and planting trees in it. Incidentally, this also helped to avoid our utilities, which tend to run um, under the pavements or close to the pavements in, in the road. Next, please. So these two photos here, I wanted to actually present them separately, but um, the way it works out, they've come out together. This is Socky Hall Street in Glasgow. Um, for the last 60 or 70 years, it's been a very vehicle dominated street. It was beginning to get a little bit tired, a little bit down at heel. Glasgow City Council had um, a significant amount of money given to it to improve the city. Um, and they've, they've started their Green Avenues programme. And what they did here is they took away some of those traffic space and reallocated that to pedestrian and to cyclists, to table spaces, and planted a row of trees in between the vehicles and these other users. And this has really, really changed the atmosphere of the street. What it's done is it's made people feel more comfortable on the pavement, it's increased cycling massively, and it's given a complete change of atmosphere and character to the street. Never had trees before historically, but what it is is they've taken the, had the courage to, to do something which hadn't been done before, and it's been a great success. Next, please. 
Another one we've worked on um, over the last 10 years or so in commercial way in Woking. This was a pedestrianised um, area, had large trees in it that were causing significant um, breaking to pavements. So taking them all out and, and redoing the, the street um, involved that they had to replant properly. Now, a problem here or a challenge here is that this is still needs to be an emergency vehicle route for fire engines um, when necessary. So this had to take significant weight of overrun, but using the green blue urban strata cell system that, that gives 60 tonnes a square metre, it meant these trees have excellent soil volumes and have matured quickly. Next, please. And that's just another view of looking back up commercial street, commercial way. Um, but it's very been very, very carefully done. This was done with Gillespie's um, and this has um, really enhanced the, the, the shopping experience. Next, please. It's not only um, wealthy southern towns that can afford this. This is mistake in, in Wales, um, which um, they planted a lot of the trees back in 2007, 2008, planted trees into a streetscape. These have grown very, very well, beginning to run out of volume now because they were very limited volumes. Next, please. But the trees are still giving us a decent canopy. And this is also important to, to consider is what are you wanting to achieve? How long are you wanting your green infrastructure to grow for? And then looking back at what you need to provide to get there. Next, please. Another uh, project we worked in, in Walthamstow, um, changing what was um, a market trader street before into a significant um, new shared space town centre. Um, now these trees are carefully positioned um, to make sure that there's seating space, has been said before, seats um, and areas, bins, but still allows uh, vehicle delivery vehicles into the town centre. Um, but it's become a very much a shared space. So when you drive along here, there's nothing to stop you doing so, but you're very aware that this is not your natural habitat. There is actually others have rights uh, there ahead of yours. Next, please. And we've carefully thought about other users, including pedestrians, including cyclists. So there's provision for all users. Next, please. An interesting uh, project we worked on with the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham was Gold Hawk Road, which was a, a retrofit SUDS, SUDS project. So this is actually using our green infrastructure to take the pressure off our combined sewers, taking water off the road through tree pits, through green infrastructure, slowing that water down, watering the trees, but then releasing that water more slowly into the sewer network. And it's this idea of just slowing the water down, holding it, using as much as we can, that is, adds an extra dimension of value to our urban green, green infrastructure. This is a pilot scheme. Trees have grown extraordinarily well. Nothing comes out for, for 60, at least 60 minutes. And approximately about 50% of all rainfall events have no um, outflow out for, at all. So it has made a difference to their combined sewer. Next, please. Another a pro project we did in Ashington in Northumberland, um, an, an ex-mining town where they had the high street was very vehicle dominated before. What they've done is they've taken a good section of that high street and given that over to pedestrians, to rain gardens, to tree planting. And this is where the weekly market is actually held around the trees. These are designed not to cause any problems in pedestrian flow, but when it's um, the market isn't there, it really creates a really a nice shopping experience. Next, please. Another one in the heart of the city. This is uh, Leonard uh, Circus, right on the junction of the City of London and the uh, London Borough of Hackney. Was a, quite a busy crossroads, very vehicle dominated before. Carefully um, re replanned to have trees set out around the vehicle turning areas so that it doesn't actually block anything, but from whichever 
direction you're coming in, you are aware that this is a shared space. Although officially not a shared space, it automatically helps uh, divert and slow vehicles down. So you have to work around these chicanes, natural of, of the trees, but it's become a really great place to be. Some brilliant uh, food stalls if you're ever, ever in the city, I'd encourage you to go along there. Next, please. The other thing is we want to start thinking about not just what it does for us today or tomorrow, but long term value that it builds in. We're seeing um, an increase in interest in green infrastructure in developments because we're aware that it adds value to residential property, it enables you to charge more for commercial rent, it actually brings the whole area up. One of the most cost effective ways to regenerate an area is to plant green infrastructure but plant it, plant it properly. There's been this great worry about maintenance. What we say is well-planted, well-installed green infrastructure is very maintenance low. Maintenance liabilities come when we try and skim up front and we end up backloading the issue. Next, please. And what we're seeing is that really forward thinking developers are doing this. They are thinking ahead as to how that their properties are going to be looking in 20, 30, 40 years time and make a provision for that green infrastructure to be lasting there. This is a project down in Bath that we've been working with a social housing provider, providing decent quality accommodation but with green infrastructure built in and ring fenced within their budget. Next, please. Another option and one we encourage is trying to think suds in terms of site wide. This is um, Flett and Keys in Peterborough. The whole scheme, which is a large redevelopment um, of existing buildings and new builds, um, which is completely suds compliant. The developer indicated to us he'd saved over £700,000 by using rain gardens and tree pits to drain this site into the River Neen, which you can see in the back of the background of the photograph. It's all done through gravity, so there's no pumping, there are no large pipes, there's no surface water connection. Everything is done through these below ground. And next, please. <clears throat> And above ground swales, these are swales that run down alongside the apartment buildings, taking all the water off the roof and then treating that as long as it can before it overspills into the neem. Next, please. So what we want to think about is the long term. Um, when we start thinking about green infrastructure, particularly when we're talking about the planting of urban trees, we should be able to look ahead 100 years. With many of the benefits that we are now gleaning from our ancestors, from the Victorians who gave us and, and bequeathed us such a great green infrastructure in many of our towns and cities, are not going to be around in 100 years' time. Much of that will have come to the end of its life. Are we thinking about the, the long term now? It's a challenge whether when we are very much in a short term parliamentary or local authority cycle, or even when we're in a developer mode, when we're thinking of the short term, then moving on to the next project, can we provide for really long term green infrastructure? Next, please. And another area we're currently working on is can we use green walls and green roofs in a wider way? There are challenges, particularly in new build, um, getting the NHBC approvals for planting close to existing foundations. This is one of the uh, ventilation shafts for the Elizabeth line and a planning requirement was that it was um, green clad. So using the green blue urban wire um, climbing systems, we're encouraging the planting of, tree, uh, of plants on vertical facades. We believe that this is uh, going to be an inc uh, increasing use of this as we see more challenges at ground level. Can we think of other ways to clad our buildings to get those benefits, whether it's air quality, whether it's temperature, whether it's water attenuation, using vertical facades for that? Next, please. And then we've worked with the EU in the Interreg pro uh, programme, getting water resilient cities. And next, please. Cool towns. So these are initiatives where we're trialling different pilot schemes to find how the most effective way ways are 
of becoming more climate tolerant or climate change ready um, across Europe. Next, please. Amongst these are things like using rain gardens to deal with runoff from our car parks when we have larger areas of impermeable ground, particularly car parks in our town centres, shopping um, centres. Can we use those to uh, use the runoff from those to go through rain gardens, giving us increasing biodiversity, helping us become more more um, uh, uh, able to cope with those runoffs, slowing that water down? Next, please. And what we find is it's actually very, very cost effective. Drain the water through the soil. The plants take up a lot of that water. The, sl the, wa the, the soil slows and cleans it down to the point at which we can then discharge that into water courses with no risk of pollutants. Next, please. So rather than putting in big pipes, rather than upsizing all our drainage systems, can we think about using nature-based solutions which give us so much more than just um, our water, solving our, our flooding issues, they're giving us a biodiversity, they're giving us, they're bringing us um, so much to our urban areas. Next please. And looking ahead to the planning, how we can do this through the planning process, how we can use our local plans, how we can use our SPDs, how we can change this emphasis um, on providing for the car to providing for people providing for habitat, that's for us, as well as for um, other flora and fauna. And then think about the circular economy, what we use, materials we use, can they be re, um, recycled again at the end of their use? Is this something that um, we could reuse somewhere else? Green Blue Urban at its heart has a circular economy using only recycled material and producing our products, which can be recycled again up to five times. Next, please. And looking ahead to how we can use the tools that are given to us, whether it is the MPPF um, or the potential implementation of Schedule 3, using um, the Environment Act when it becomes enacted, and using these to really nudge our, our planners, our architects, our designers, our developers to do things in a more sustainable way. Next, please. And then using young people, we find that the young people that are coming out of university, coming out of education now, are used to working with other people, collaboration, generation, um, and, and achieving far more than just a single discipline would in itself. Next, please. And we want to think about um, how we can um, use this circular economy. What we're doing now, how will that be used in 10 years time, 20 years time. We don't have a crystal ball, but we can have some idea. We can, we can in, uh, influence in a certain sense how things are gonna be used in the future. Next, please. So Green Blue Urban, we design from below the ground up. We look at what we're seeking to achieve long-term above ground, and we start with looking at what we can achieve below ground. And this is so important when we're looking at green infrastructure, is what you do in terms of preparation will define what is going to happen in the future. We can't stress enough the importance of getting your soil right, getting your below ground provision correct, making sure that there's root management so we're not going to have future liabilities, and then enabling the green infrastructure with its trees, green walls, planters, whatever to grow to maturity. Next, please. The root space system is the green blue urban soil cell system made from 100% recycled and we're also making this from reclaimed marine waste now but using that to support the paving to enable the soil to remain uncompacted and really recreating the ideal forest floor conditions in which trees can flourish in our urban areas. Next please. One challenge that we're having in many of our towns and cities is, is the need that we have to increase the number of electric vehicle charging points in our um, constricted urban areas, particularly in many of our residential streets. I think over 30% of our properties don't have off-road parking, so we're going to need to provide electric vehicle charging for that. 
we say this opens up rather than the problem this opens up great opportunities whilst we're doing these civils works to install our electrical supplies why don't we start thinking about subsystems why don't we get a tree planted in there so you can park your car under the tree in the summer keep it cool while it's charging we are saving so much money and we're saving carbon by doing these installations and looking together how we can amalgamate as much into one installation as possible next please and thinking about how that by planting effectively we can help mitigate against climate change we can help with our stormwater prevention uh, stormwater management we can bring our extra biodiversity we can allow that tree pit system to take some of our runoff water, but at the same time, we can bring, connect into our electrical supply. It's really a no brainer when we can tick as many boxes together in one project. Next, please. So thank you very much indeed for listening to us today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. My enthusiasm for green infrastructure in urban areas is unabated. I see massive opportunities. I see it's a great time to be involved in green infrastructure, but um, we need to showcase the ways that we get around the challenges to overcome these hurdles, which will be there, but working with the government, particularly DEFRA at the moment, are looking into ways of planting around utilities to overcome these issues so that we can really bequeath a green and sustainable future to to those coming after us thank you very much and thank you howard that was fantastic and those before and after pictures were just wonderful and um, seeing the trees flourishing and growing and and doing so well is just so heartening particularly when unfortunately we do see some new trees that are planted um, with proper care and attention and don't flourish. So thank you for that. It's cheered me up no end seeing all those lovely trees. Um, so now I'm going to move on to our next speaker. Do put your questions in the in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try and take as many as we can at the end of this uh, session. So I'm really, really delighted to introduce to you Alvaro Novas Filguera who's the project leader and architect at West Eight, which is um, a design practice based in the Netherlands, some of you might have heard of. Um, Alvaro has been working there since 2013. In addition to working on designs from the initial concept stage all the way through to the final installations, he's contributed to a wide range of West Eight's award-winning projects for clients such as Google and the Trust for Houston Bot Botanical Gardens. And Alvaro is going to talk to us about the design proposals for the Parque Central in Madrid, Spain. And when I read about these a few months ago, I was just so bowled over. So um, I'm really pleased to have Alvaro here today and look forward to his talk. Over to you, Alvaro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. We are happy and pleased uh, to share with you our uh, winning proposal for Parque Central Madrid Nuevo Norte, Central Park in Madrid, in Spain. Uh, next, please. So as an introduction, we are uh, West States. Uh, we're an international office with more than 30 years of experience in different fields, like landscape architecture, urban planning, architecture, and industrial design. Uh, we approach every project from a, a multidisciplinary uh, uh, vision. So we, are, uh, we do from master planning to landscape parks or uh, architecture and even is the design of the benches and the urban furniture of the cities. Uh, some of our projects can uh, uh, show this multidisciplinary approach like the Governor's Island in New York, in the United States or Miami Soundscape or the London Jubilee Gardens and the future Bernie Spain Gardens that is under construction now as well in London. Next. So our uh, one of our showcase projects of the office is uh, Madrid Rio. That is a competition is the same format as the project that I will explain later with Parque Central. So it was the same uh, competition, international competition we won in 20 years ago. And uh, it was uh, realized between 2005 and 2011. And uh, it's a, a linear park that run, uh, goes along the river uh, Manzanares in Madrid and is over the infrastructure that is covering the, um, the, the, the national road, the highway that goes now underground. And then the outcome of this is to is a park that is quite 
big, uh, have a bigger acceptation in the city and the capital. As you can see in the photos, what was at the beginning of 2011 and today is a mass urban rich green area of the city that is connecting to the uh, other green networks of the capital. Can you go next, please? This green network infrastructure is uh, uh, is already made by centuries ago. It's not. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, adding uh, extra extra layers of uh, green infrastructure in the city. So they, it started in Madrid with the Enlightenment period, with a good example, one of the most beautiful parks that is the Park del Retiro. And then we have as well uh, in the 20th, 20th century is uh, actually uh, uh, acting in this sort of big avenues opening the city with uh, trees and boulevards and uh, greenering all the uh, main, main areas of the, of the city. And today's agenda of Madrid, the city of Madrid, there is a metropolitan forest. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a master plan that is going to be connecting all the surrounding natural areas that today is Madrid. Uh, so the aim of this plan is to connect all the green infrastructure outside Madrid and as well to the inside interior green areas of Madrid of the city. Can you go next, please? Uh, and what's the future? The future is um, uh, the urban master plan that is made 10 years ago by Richard Royers. Uh, this is a, a new area that is going to be developed on the north of of the city in uh, around the Chamartin today Chamartin station train station uh, as you see above in the right photo this is how it looks today and in the future it's going to be one of the biggest urban development in Europe and it's going to be completely sustainable and uh, um, green uh, uh, master plan with uh, residential uh, buildings with offices and as well uh, with commerce uh, can you go next please So the park that you see here today is, uh, this is the winning proposal and this uh, park is around the Chamartin train station. So it's around, uh, surrounding the train station and it has different areas. Uh, it's at 35 hectares with new space that is gonna be created. And uh, we have the southern part, there is the left part, that is, we call it South Park. We have the right part, that is the central part, that is most, the biggest one. And the uh, below one uh, linear part that is called the bamboo. Um, park. All are around the ch future Chamartin station that is going to be as well as today's in a competition and it's going to be announced the winner soon and we are going to collaborate with them to integrate both areas. Uh, next please. Uh, so the brief of the competition well, uh, it was asking for several different layers, different uh, topics uh, to deliver a 21st century park. A 21st century park that needs to work together with uh, ecology, with the community, with uh, uh, accomplish some of the thermodynamic, thermodynamic and as well as sustainability issues today, and culture, bringing culture and art and media and technology, uh, but as well in, uh, connecting to the neighborhood and to the community. Next. And with also these topics on the brief, uh, the brief was asking as well, uh, uh, there were some physical constraints. Those physical constraints are coming because uh, the park needs to be built on top of a concrete slab. A concrete slab is going to be covering the today existing train rails. And uh, the outcome of this is that we have some installations, some uh, ventilation shafts that has, has a kind of a big volume. There are nine of them and has more than three meters high and two and a half by five meter uh, size. Um, and as well, they gave us uh, this uh, diagram you see on the top on the right that has different green tones. So this, this, this is meaning the, the, the maximum soil that we could have on top of the slide because of weight. So those hatches more darker green. We could add one meter and a half that was easy enough, or it is enough to have mature trees, but the one meter was not enough to have those uh, to plant trees. But uh, we, uh, of course, the, the competition was done with a team of collaborators. We have structural engineers, we have industrial designers, we have as well as uh, sustainability consultants. Etc. So thanks to it, uh, our conversation with our structural engineers, we figure out that we could add extra soil on top of each column of the uh, of the slab. Therefore, can you go next, please? Therefore, adding these two layers, the, uh, the layer of the hatching of the areas, we could plant one meter and a half soil, uh, plus the uh, area or the lining, the lining 
along the columns where we can add extra soil, we could achieve the target to the goal or solve all the technical difficulties to uh, define an, uh, what is a park or a urban forest. Next one, please. So uh, yeah, so that this is a goal. So this was the target of, a, of the first our target inside of uh, the competition to bring a bring a, 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 a urban forest, a dense mass of green that can bring a sixty five percent of shadow drop in the site temperature and helping to bring a free green oasis inside of the city, inside of the area of Madrid Nuevo Norte. Next, please. So this is an image, a render that visualizes more or less how it's going to be in the future. This area, this park. Next. So once we have the, our uh, technical, uh, so we always approach the project from a technical point of view. How we can solve all the constraints to uh, plant or to have as much as green area as possible. Then we started playing with the idea of. Uh, uh, the design, what kind of design we can add to this park. So we, we thought it was a good approach to uh, uh, to look at an existing situation to, of the train rails and to translate this kind of uh, tribute to mobility into a design language. And that's what we, uh, as you see in the, in the image on the right, how we could adapt this kind of nice design lines that we have on the, on the, on the project next. These design lines, of course, we need to adapt it to the uh, different uh, uh, areas of the, of, the, of the park. So, for instance, uh, you know, these lines are as well connecting to the streets on the sides, as well to the station and to the future cultural art uh, music center that is going to be on the right side of the image of the diagram. And those uh, two layers, so let's say the layer, the positive and the negative of the hardscape and the soft, subscape combined, uh, is delivering. Can you go next, please? Is delivering uh, the outcome of a, 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 a nice design or a beautiful design, but it's departing from solving the technical and the issues of how we could add as much as extra soil on top of a slab, complete slab. Next, please. Uh, we also learned from the client that uh, the, all the today existing infrastructure buildings are going to be dismantled and demolished, and demolished, and they're going to install a treatment plant there on site. And they're going to recycle the materials. So uh, we approach this uh, idea to use as much as possible all the materials that are going to be re recycled into our um, structures and buildings that we are going to pavilions as well that we're going to have in the park, our walls or many other 3D elements that we are going to uh, design. They're, they're going to part of, be a part of the design of the park. Next. So talking about these pavilions that are going to be made with this uh, reused material, uh, those pavilions are we have uh, the extra to uh, to place it, uh, place it not randomly on the park, but along the uh, nine ventilation shafts that I talked before. So to integrate these ventilation shafts, normally it's something that is not as aesthetic or visual. Uh, nice element to see in the park. So we uh, integrate them into the into the pavilion, to each of them pavilion, and as well into a sort of a land, sometimes into a mountain or into a landscape. So we camouflage those ventilation shafts, and as well we are researching how we can uh, uh, reutilize the heat and the energy produced under in the train tracks uh, area in the tunnel. So how can we use this uh, uh, heat to, for instance, reutilize this into the pavilions and the restaurants and the cafeterias? Next one, please. So, um, so having those layers, so let's say the the, the, uh, the layers that I talked before about um, the the green infrastructure, uh, the pavilions. We also started adding the layer of programming. So we to deliver a twenty first century park, we also need to think. In, in a program that includes all the users of a, of a park. So we have, for instance, uh, we work with the playgrounds, we work as well with uh, adding some uh, areas for markets, some areas for uh, um, uh, sports as well. Next, next one, please. So, and as well, some community gardens, some uh, virtual gardens and uh, orchards where um, community can be engaged and can be as well uh, with this, within the schools, we can create workshops to come with uh, young kids so they can learn from the early ages the importance of having nature and uh, 
and, uh, and in, the, in, in their cities. So they can learn from, for instance, planting, they can go and plant some trees, they can learn from the teachers and the people that work in the park, how, the, uh, how is the maintenance and how is the park working. Next one. Next. As well, we have some areas of sports. So the, the leisure uh, layer of, uh, of, uh, of a park is also important. Activity is healthy and also uh, is uh, uh, gathering, of course, the youngest uh, generations to come to, to the park. Next. Uh, we have a, an active uh, two spines of active planes so on both edges of the park. Uh, next to the residential and offices on both sides, uh, we have uh, these uh, spines that are going to uh, uh, have an activated terraces during the whole day, and as well a bike path where people can, they, they're going to work a sort of a boulevard so people can walk and bike and as well meet with people, their friends and have a, a coffee. Next one, please. There is always welcome in these uh, cities like Madrid, the uh, outdoor living and the meeting and uh, uh, enjoying. Next one. And as well, together with these two, uh, um, with these two spines, we have a central spine that is connecting the Madrid to Martin Station with a future cultural musical center. And it crosses the park from south to north. And uh, it's going to have different areas, different areas of activities and different areas of uh, how people can enjoy uh, uh, the central part of the park. Next one. Uh, so uh, then in, in this spine, these areas, one of them, the, one of the most important ones, the central lawn is, is kind of, it's a clear in the forest. So it's an area where we are going to have a small uh, hardscape plaza. It's as well with a lawn where people can meet. It's a meeting point or it can be as well, you can host some small events or cultural art exhibitions as well as concerts. Or you can, on, or you can uh, meet with your friends to have a picnic on the, on the grass or workers, the future workers of the office and area that is going to be on the north part and the south part of the park can gather as well to eat a sandwich in their resting hours. Next. And the, the, the next uh, active space is, uh, uh, is a flexible space, is a plaza of the culture of the Center for Art and Music, the future one that is going to be built on the other side of the park. There we create a sort of a flexible area where uh, uh, there's going to be uh, bigger events. Uh, uh, we are planning to make bigger events there, like a sports, uh, like a tennis match, or a big concerts, or even uh, Christmas markets. And uh, with the aim to have a 24 7 activated uh, program uh, in this area. Next, please. So, um, together, of course, with uh, um, it's as important as it is, all the layers that I explained before, is as well the, uh, uh, the definition of every element or every um, uh, design element that we introduce in the park. We also design some street lighting, uh, benches, uh, areas uh, for seating and edges. Uh, so all this giving a, a clear identity and a clear form to, uh, to the park and to uh, uh, the users of the park are going to be most, more, uh, they're going to identify better uh, the uh, areas of the park. And, uh, and of course, as well as important as the physical identities, as well as digital identity. So we also work with our collaborators to, um, with our uh, um, designers to make a, a digital uh, uh, branding of the park. That can be, for instance, uh, with your phone, you can have an app of the park where it's going to tell you what is going to be celebrated in the park, what's going to ha what's happening today, what's happening next week, and that's also important to. Uh, let's say uh, to arrive to achieve to all the different generations and targets of, the, of group targets of the users of the future park. Can you go next, please? And uh, the last layer, so uh, that we thought that this park can uh, need to have, or uh, uh, was, or we thought it was a good idea, is to in this clear in the forest in this central plaza, this central space or lawn. Uh, we thought it was a good idea to. Um, to bring some shadow because of the, of the climate and temperature of Madrid uh, that is so hot in summers, 
uh, if, we, if you want to celebrate any activity outdoors, you need to salute. Therefore, we thought uh, maybe a, an element there that can absorb as well this design language of uh, mobility and lines uh, uh, that is in the, in the present in the part, they can all these lines can convert together and create a sort of a vortex or a vertical element that gives this shadow and creates a sort of a beacon of a, or icon in the element in the park or a meeting point. Next. So uh, the interior uh, uh, of this uh, wind garden, we call it, is a, is a tribute to the Mediterranean uh, ferns. And this is, is uh, it's going to be a vertical garden with, uh, with uh, active and passive systems. We are going to have a greenery uh, inside of ferns, and it's going to refresh the area, the, the area underneath the plaza. So it's going to create a, so it's going to create the conditions, the good conditions to celebrate, for instance, uh, uh, exhibitions, art exhibitions, or performances, or as well music concerts, etc. Next. So, uh, so the, the trees together with the park and all the greenery and the tower, uh, we, we think it's gonna achieve in the future, in the years, in the future, in the long term, it's gonna drop the temperature of the area and it's gonna create a microclimate in the neighborhood, in the future neighborhood of this, of this uh, Madrid Novo Norte. Therefore, uh, we also thought um, that increasing the amount of trees and as much as we, could in the and studying as well all the winds and all the uh, uh, performances of the tower is going to achieve this in the future, uh, in the near future. Next, the wind tower. Uh, just a small explanation of how it works. So we're going to have uh, this uh, vertical element that is going to have uh, different skins. So we have an outer skin that is going to make be made by um, reused aluminium panels. Aluminium panel, the aluminium is going to come from the uh, treatment plant that I talked before. So, um, we're going, so we're going to reuse all the material. And these perforated aluminium panels are going to allow the wind to go through the north wind. So we simulate the entire part with the trees and the tower, and we position them in a certain way that uh, the, 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 the direction of the, and the speed of the north winds can perfectly work. And, um, and absorb all the coolness to, uh, to refresh and to make create a microclimate in this area. So those north winds are going to come from the top, and with a system of active and passive methods like mist jets and uh, fans, etc., they're going to uh, drop this uh, cooling uh, uh, air into the lower areas of the, of the of the tower and bring it into this square, and it's going to create a comfort thermodynamical uh, comfort area. As well, these low aluminum panels are going to work to together to reflect uh, the sun rays. So it's going to, uh, they're not going to heat uh, the green garden that we have inside. And the green garden is going to be made as well with uh, recycled material and soil and, uh, and planting as well. So we are going to, uh, in the future, if this tower needs to be dismantled, there's is possible because we are going to uh, make it with a steel structure. That's kind of easy to dismount and to place it in another place or to reuse cycle the, the, the material into something else. Next one, please. So um, this tower, uh, so the tower is going to have not only a, a certain itself uh, beacon or icon in park is going to have as well a reflection in what's happening today or tomorrow in the park. So it's going to change. We work uh, intensively with an artist, a lighting artist. So it's going to reflect the activity that is happening in the park. Next one, please. So with this set, so with all the layers all together, com the combination of them, we are aiming to uh, give a park that is responding to the demands of the 21st century park. And with the most important Important element that is a 20 is a, a, a urban mass or a forest that in the future is going to be part as well of these green networks uh, or infrastructure of the city of Madrid and, uh, and together with Madrid Rio. So we have a good expansion of Madrid Rio uh, is going to work in a good symphony and to for the long for the future generations to have a, a healthy city to live in. Thank you very much. 
And thank you, Elbro. That that was completely fascinating and so inspiring. And um, uh, I'm going to have to go back to Madrid uh, year after year to to watch what happens. That's brilliant. So thank you very much. Um, perhaps our uh, speakers could now put their cameras on, and if we could have the slide, the next slide. I think it's the discussion slide. Thank you. Um, so uh, at this point of today, my, my voice is clearly going, so I'm going to ask a question and hand over to the speakers. Uh, we've had quite a few speakers, uh, sorry, questions around parking. So I'm going to ask Howard if you could take this first question. Um, a lot of those fantastic projects you showed uh, were in essence, getting rid of parking spaces and putting trees in instead, which I think lots of us would love to do, but there is a lot of resistance to it. So in your experience, how have you or your clients managed to get over that resistance and make that happen? It's a really good question. And it's something that comes up in pretty much every project. In our experience, the, the projects work best where there's a genuine um, working with residents, working with stakeholders to understand what's trying to be achieved and the fact that it is give and take. Um, the the um, reliance that we've had on the public, uh, on private transport, really, it is a it is a, um, a, a hurdle that we have to overcome. Um, what we've found on the whole is that once people start realising that the benefits that can accrue for green infrastructure, there is a preparedness to come to a compromise. Um, although, for example, in Alfred Place, where the, the whole street was taken out, um, and I mean, that was a very dramatic situation and, and, and it's worked extremely well. Um, but that is probably more of a, um, a commercial environment than, than a residential one. And people are very precious about the, the parking space outside the house. Uh, and we've, we've, I guess we've all seen this, that, you know, yeah, we all love trees, but perhaps the one down the road outside Mrs. Smith's might be better than outside mine. Uh, and, and, and this is something that we are just constantly working against. There's no, there's no um, silver bullet, but it is something that we find consultation working with stakeholders is the best way around it. And Barry, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, thank, thank you, Julia. Um, one of the approaches we're taking is we've created uh, a green infrastructure fund and um, which we're calling our Green Together program. And we've also created a thriving estates program, which both of which look to, to enable residents and community groups to put forward ideas for creating green infrastructure, either on their estates or in their, um, in their street, uh, or in some cases parks as well. And the aim behind that is twofold. One, to find out where there's actually genuine community buy-in for changes, think about what their ideas is, and also to try and help with that, that maintenance headache, because it is a headache, is, is how, do we, how do we enable the community to take on some of that responsibility? So if we are going to provide the funds, we can create the infrastructure in partnership with them, then the expectation is that there needs to be their involvement to support and sustain that. Um, it's early days for us with that, but what we are seeing is that we're not we're not short of people who are willing to come forward with ideas and wanting um, to actually create those spaces on their doorstep. So we're running we'll be rolling those out over the next sort of twelve to eighteen months, um, and hopefully successfully. Great, thank you very much. And, and Barry, I'd actually like to come back to you with a question. Um, a, a lot of the theme of today has been around skills and having <coughs> the right people with the right skills in the right jobs. And, and that can mean recruiting people. It can mean training people. And, and what you've been going through with your team is a huge culture change. And I wonder if you could just say, has that had positive, a positive impact on people's motivation, on staff retention, on staff recruitment? Uh, because all of those things are, are so difficult at the moment. Uh, has, has it helped? Um, yes, I think I think I'll start off with sort of that changing culture, um, particularly uh, when you look at the frontline workforce, our, our, just our, our gardening teams. I think there's a there's an aging workforce there, um, and there's a workforce that 
it, it worked in the same way for quite a long time. So there's a there's a significant step change. If you if you go from telling people, well, you're just going to go out and, and do your day job to actually you're going to have to work site alongside the community and residents and start communicating and interacting with them. For some people, that's that's not what they want to do. That's a big, big change. And I'll, I'll have to say there's probably a longer battle to be had there. But there are others that are really open to that idea. They actually they actually see the benefits and uh, from working with other people, both in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, just getting getting a lot of their job done by someone else, you know. And it's where we've got some of those practical examples. Where I mean, we've got one guy, one gentleman who who started working in our parks as, as a volunteer because he had some mental health issues, and it was his escape. And He's now a one-man force of nature in that park. He does pretty much all the maintenance. And the gardening team love it because they turn up at the site and things are done for them. And that's what we're using as examples to sort of go, look, if you nurture and support these groups, you enable them to do more. Actually, this can make your job easier. It can make your sites look better. It can lead to less complaints. And I think that's going to be a big, big part of the challenge. And I think in terms of retention, then, you'll get much more job satisfaction from that, from working in that environment. Thank you. Uh, and Catherine, I wonder if I could turn to you because you, you've worked with Islington and Camden on, on this Parks for Health strategy, but you've also worked with many, many other councils. Do you get a sense that there's um, a desire for innovation at the moment? Obviously, things are very, very difficult at the moment. Is, is that meaning that people are willing to do things that perhaps they weren't in the past? Or is it the opposite that um, with people struggling for budgets and so on, that everybody just focused on doing what they do and they don't have time for innovation. Which way do you think it works? It works both ways. I think it, you know, either of those things can be true. Um, and it depends to a degree on the on the culture, ex the pre-existing culture of, of the, the council or indeed organization in, in question. Um, I mean, constraint can foster that that innovation um but it does require a degree of um, energy and openness and and leadership um and i would say certainly for the parks for health experience in camden is linked in the political will and leadership and support for that change has been very real um and you need that it needs to it needs to come from from there um and although not exactly necessarily the point that you were making, but um, you know, Barry was alluding to um, some of, well, the success in um, securing long-term commitment to um, ongoing and in, indeed increased funding for parks within Islington. Um, and that was, quite, that was about culture and support, but also using the evidence, the, the range of different kinds of evidence to build that case and show how this speaks to a range of priorities, including the health and well-being ones. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's something that's come through very clearly today. It's um, and through other work that the TCPA has done, particularly with public health teams, is it's so important to get the evidence, to measure the situation beforehand, to measure it at the end, and look at what's changed. And uh, Barry, would you like to come in? Yeah, just just to add about that 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 headspace to be able to think about that change in innovation. That's just it's a shout out to the the Future Fox Accelerator Program because that that funding and that different way of of working actually created the the capacity within our teams to be able to have that headspace to think about this this transformation. And I think it, it I'm I'm really hoping there's going to be a, a second phase of that, and there's going to be some other other boroughs that are going to benefit from that because it was a it was a brilliant thing for us. And we, we, while we were thinking about these things, we were stuck in that business as usual mode. We didn't have the capacity. We were fighting all those your normal fires that you were all fighting at the moment. So funding like that is really critical to allowing innovation. Thank you. Um, Alvaro, I'd like to turn to you now. Uh, the, I think we're all a bit blown away by seeing what you're proposing um, for Madrid. It's just amazing on so many different levels. And it's more ambitious than many, many things to being proposed in the UK. Is it actually going to happen? Uh, does it have that leadership and that support and that funding that will mean it will happen? 
Uh, yes, so that's, um, I forgot to mention that. Uh, so uh, the competition was held by, uh, uh, let's say, uh, it's a private group of entities that are uh, merging together. And they create this Madrid Nuevo Norte. So it's a kind of a, a board of uh, experts that are driving, let's say, the private interest uh, uh, of these co entities into, into physical reality. So those are the ones that are our clients, let's say, uh, the ones that belong to the competitions for the different areas of this master plan. So in this case, our Parque Central. So, uh, so this is a kind of typical, uh, um, I think it's in many countries as well. So it's a mix of uh, public interest and private. So the private, in this case, are gonna, uh, let's say, pay all the costs of making all the entire urban plan streets and the park. And then once it's done, they're hand on, handing over into the town hall into the Madrid city hall, the, the, let's say for the future, the maintenance, the costing of the maintenance of the park. So in a way, uh, let's, we can say that the, the, the private interest is, a, is a, let's say, most important part in this moment for the realization of the park and the, all the surroundings. And the maintenance is gonna be part of the public. So, but they are the most interested per, uh, entities to have a beautiful uh, park and trees in front of the offices and residential so they can, uh, develop it, uh, this area in a beautiful way that the cost of it in the future is, is going to increase, of course. It's not the same to have a building in front of you than to have a beautiful park, the one that we're proposing. Thank you. And I think when the competition, uh, the, the winning proposal that West Oak put forward was announced, it was the mayor of Madrid. So it, it was a public sector leader who, who announced it, demonstrating there is that support. Um, we don't really have time to go into questions of, of funding and local taxation uh, in this session, but I'd love to know whether the public sector will recoup some value from that improved realm that, uh, that will be created. Uh, it is possible in some places. It doesn't really work very well in, in the UK, which is a big problem we face. Um, so uh, that's for another day, I think. So coming back to the really mundane stuff, quite a few questions about vandalism. Uh, vandalism and trees, I'm afraid we see it quite a lot. New trees are planted, and sadly, sometimes uh, people uh, aren't very nice to them. Uh, Barry, do you have any thoughts about how, you know, how that can be dealt with, either proactively or, or reactively? Sorry. Um, oh, tricky one. Um, I don't think I have the overall answer to that. I think the, the key thing is is creating that strong sense of ownership from the community with those spaces. Uh, you know, the more the more people you have out in those spaces interacting with them in a positive way, the less chance you are going to have a vandalism. So I think the, the stuff that we're doing in terms of creating um, more uh, community usage, more community engagement with those spaces, whether they're on the on the streets or, or within our parks is, is probably the best way of solving that um because there's no sort of design thing that's going to stop making um vandalism i'm afraid thank you and catherine would you like to come in i think you're on mute i was so busy lowering my hands i forgot <laughs> the unmuting was more important <laughs> But uh, it's one or the other. Um, I, I was going to make the same point about um, ownership. Um, I think there's a, an allied point, and it came through from things that Barry said and also things that Howard said, which is to do with change. And I think um, one of the things it's useful for us all to remember is that actually most of us don't like change if someone else imposes it upon us. Um, which will speak to the changing of the parking space or the, or the tree or, um, you know, I, I even got one, one councillor to admit that although everything he did was pro cycling, when he opened his door and found that there was a cycling stand suddenly outside his front door, he went, what's that? <laughs> um, and of course, he was entirely happy with it, having had that first reaction. But I, I, I think we have to acknowledge that, and particularly in recent times when we've been so constrained and our lives have been changed by something pretty dramatic um, in the form of the pandemic, that we shouldn't dismiss that. And I think acknowledging that and working with people and asking them what they want um, won't stop all the vandalism and all the objections, 
but it should mitigate the risk of that. Thank you very much. Um, Howard, uh, we have a few seconds left. Would you like to come in and uh, make a final point? Just totally support what both Barry and Catherine have said. <clears throat> Working with the stakeholders rather than imposing things on them. But then also we sometimes have to think about the protection side. In some areas we have to put tree grills, tree guards. It's not all vandalism isn't necessarily by people. Unfortunately, we do have animals that also damage things. And there are a number of um, unfortunate people that still can't park. But we do have to think about the ability to protect them. And get this balance between planting trees that are large enough so they don't get damaged. There's been a lot of move forward to planting big trees because you get instant impact, and you get more vandal resistance, but then there's substantially more cost involved. So it's really a balance, but I, I totally agree with what Barry said. If, if we can get people feeling it's their tree, they are not only going to not vandalise it themselves, they're also going to be pretty touchy if anybody else does. Great, thank you very much. And on that, I'm afraid we're going to have to draw the conversation to an end. And I really wish we could have more, more chats about these fascinating subjects. So I'd like to thank all of you um, speakers very, very much indeed for your fantastic presentations. And thank you to uh, the audience for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get more of them to the speakers, uh, but perhaps they might be able to try and answer them later. Um, I'd particularly like to thank our sponsors, Green Blue Urban, Heatherwick Studios and the Landscape Institute for making this event possible and to making it uh, free tickets possible. We will be recording and posting the recordings on the TCPA website and we'll send you all a link to those very soon. Uh, do keep out an eye on our website. Uh, next week we've got a webinar coming up about 20 minute neighbourhoods so you might like to join that too. Uh, thank you all very much and we hope to see you at the next event. Bye bye.